Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother, Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. Yeah, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come, Follow Me lesson for March 8th through 14th, 2021. This is covering Doctrine and Covenants sections 23 through 26. And now, let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. Hooray for the scriptures. Oh, it's so great to see them. And now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 11 minutes, 21 seconds. Um, but what would it be for the week? Well, that is the week. What? It'll just take you 11 minutes and <laughs> oh 21 goodness. seconds to read all week. Oh, my goodness. If you want okay. to break it up daily, yeah, it'll take one minute and 37 seconds. Wow. So I think you can do that one. Yeah, again, short reading more time for study. Indeed. Let's take a look at the time codes. This will walk us through section by section. And John, before we start, I've noticed what I consider to be an oversight. An oversight, you say? Yeah. See, one of the things that's really helpful in our scripture study is to learn the books of scripture. So, you know, like the Book of Mormon has 15 books and the Old Testament has 39 and the New Testament 27. Well, one way to help, one of the really effective ways is to make a song out of it. And I noticed that in our children's songbook that there are really great songs to learn the books, but we don't have any song to learn the sections of the Doctrine and Covenants, and there's so many of them. So I've decided um, to fill that void. Yes, fill that void and have a song for learning the Doctrine and Covenants, the sections of the Doctrine and Covenants. Okay. So let me share it with you now for the first time. The first time here it is, and I hope this will make it into the children's songbook at some point. This is really going to help everybody. It starts like this. <clears throat> Section one is the preface of the Lord's Book. Section two comes next, then take a look. It's three, then four, then five, then six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. It's very catchy. Just try to resist. Then it's thirteen, fourteen, I fifteen. Think we better and fast forward 16, a little bit of 17, this. 35, then 136. Wow. Section 137 is really great. And right after that comes 138, official declarations, one and two. That's all we have till we get something new. Wow. So, what do, what um, do you think? I, I, it's unique. <laughs> yeah, I think it's going to be a big It's hit. very original. Okay, so you guys, that's for you. I hope that helps. I hope you can learn all the sections of the Doctrine and Covenants that way. All right. Well, let's get back to the lesson, shall we? Where we left off, the church has been restored. On April 6th, 1830, Joseph and Oliver are sustained as the first elder and second elder, respectively, and the church learns by revelation that you must be baptized by proper authority. So those that were baptized in previous faiths would need to be rebaptized by one holding the priesthood. That brings us to Doctrine and Covenants, section 23. And let's take a look at what the Revelations in Context tells us about this section. On April 6, 1830, at Fayette, New York, Joseph Smith formally organized what was then called the Church of Christ. Shortly afterward, he was approached by Oliver Cowdery, Hiram Smith, Samuel H. Smith, Joseph Smith Sr., and Joseph Knight Sr., each being anxious to know of the Lord what might be their respective duties in relation to this work. Joseph provided each of them with a brief personal revelation. Similar in context, length, and wording, the revelations appear to have been dictated one after the other. Acting as scribe, John Whitmer recorded each as a separate revelation, but when the revelations were published in the 1835 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants, they were combined into one section, which is now known as Doctrine and Covenants 23. So there you go. Now, what's interesting about this is that we don't really know exactly when this series of revelation was received. In the Joseph Smith Revelations book, they mentioned that Joseph Smith's history and other sources suggest that the revelations date between the April 6th organization and an April 11th meeting, both of which took place in Fayette Township, New York. So that's our best guess. 
It's possible that this was actually received even before Section 22. Again, that whole chronology problem that we've been having throughout the Doctrine and Covenants. It's, it's hard to say. That's all right. We'll get better as we go. We will. And it should be interesting to note that the meeting on April 11th, that's a Sunday. So now we're on to the Sabbath worships. Nice. Well, so let's take a look in section 23, first couple of verses. This is a revelation, as we'll find, to Oliver Cowdery. Behold, I speak unto you, Oliver, a few words. Behold, thou art blessed, and art under no condemnation, but beware of pride, lest thou shouldst enter into temptation. Make known thy calling unto the church, and also before the world, and thy heart shall be opened to preach the truth from henceforth and forever. Amen. Wow. And see, that's just a short revelation. All of these are relatively short, but a lot of powerful wording in that one. From the Institute Manual, there's an expansion on the warning to beware of pride. This is a quote from President James E. Faust in the April 1996 General Conference. He says, quote, Oliver had great intellect and enjoyed marvelous spiritual blessings. However, over time, he forgot the Lord's warning, and pride entered into his heart. Brigham Young later said of this pride, I have seen men who belong to this kingdom and who really thought that if they were not associated with it, it could not progress. One man especially, whom I now think of, was peculiarly gifted in self-reliance and general ability. He said as much to the Prophet Joseph a number of times as to say that if he left this kingdom, it could not progress any further. I speak of Oliver Cowdery. He forsook it, and it still rolled on, and still triumphed over every opposing foe and bore off safely all those who clung to it. End quote. Now, whenever we have a warning to beware of pride, especially when it's focused on a specific person, we really got to take it seriously. So in Oliver's situation, as Brigham Young described him, he was incredibly capable, and that can be wonderful, but also very dangerous. So let me share with you a quote from the Institute Manual. Originally, it's an excerpt from the Church History in the Fullness of Times Manual, but this is quoted from the Doctrine and Covenants Institute Manual with a little lead-in. It says, in 1838, church leaders in Missouri charged Oliver Cowdery with persecuting church leaders with vexatious lawsuits, seeking to destroy the character of Joseph Smith, not abiding ecclesiastical authority in temporal affairs, selling lands in Jackson County, which was against counsel given by the Lord, and leaving his calling as assistant president of the church and turning to the practice of law. Oliver refused to appear before the council but he answered by letter. He denied the church's right to dictate how he should conduct his life and asked that his fellowship with the church be ended. And so it was. He was excommunicated April 12, 1838. But 10 years later, November 12, 1848, he was rebaptized and passed away March 3, 1850, due to illness before he was able to join the body of saints in Utah. Now, I don't want to introduce those ideas now to bring us down. We still have a lot of great service that's going to be happening. But I think knowing this about Oliver puts a greater emphasis on that phrase in verse 1, but beware of pride, lest thou shouldst enter into temptation. Think of all that Oliver has seen and done and what he will continue to see and do. If it can happen to Oliver, it can happen to any of us. That's a great warning for us all. Let's remember that he was the first baptized member of the church. Yeah. So let's go on to Hiram's revelation. This is in verse 3. Behold, I speak unto you, Hiram, a few words, for thou art also under no condemnation, and thy heart is opened, and thy tongue loosed, and thy calling is to exhortation, and to strengthen the church continually. Wherefore, thy duty is unto the church forever and this because of thy family. Amen. Now, interesting thought here. Do you remember when we studied Doctrine and Covenants section 11? This was another revelation to Hiram Smith, where in verse 21, he's told, Seek not to declare my word, but first seek to obtain my word, and then shall your tongue be loosed. Look at that verse again. Mm -hmm. Verse 3, 
thy tongue loosed. Yeah. It would seem that Hiram successfully obtained his word, and he's ready to go. That's wonderful. Now, there's another curious section in there at the end of verse 3 where it says, Wherefore, thy duty is unto the church forever, and this because of thy family. Now, wait a minute. Hiram, Samuel, and Joseph Smith Sr. are certainly a part of the same family, but Hiram is the only one that gets this phrase. And I'm not really sure why that phrase is there, but it's interesting to think about in context of Hiram Smith's posterity, where he has had several apostles in his line. He has had two presidents of the church, Joseph F. Smith and Joseph Fielding Smith. And there's another tribute to Hiram's family that I found in the Institute Manual, and it's from Elder M. Russell Ballard, which is interesting seeing as Elder Ballard is the second great-grandson of Hiram Smith through Elder Ballard's mother. He explained how Hiram strengthened the church and sustained his brother, the prophet. This is from October 1995 General Conference. He says, quote, Throughout Hiram's life, the forces of evil combined against him in an attempt to defeat him or at least to prompt him to stray off course. After his older brother Alvin's death in 1823, Hiram bore significant responsibility in the Smith family. At the same time, he assisted and served his brother Joseph, the prophet, throughout the long and arduous process of the Restoration. Ultimately, he joined Joseph and other martyrs of past gospel dispensations. His blood was shed as his final testimony to the world. Through it all, Hiram stood firm. He knew the course his life would take, and he consciously chose to follow it. To Joseph, Hiram became companion, protector, provider, confidant, and eventually joined him as a martyr. Unjust persecution engulfed them throughout their lives. Although he was older, Hiram recognized his brother's divine mantle. While he gave Joseph strong counsel on occasion, Hiram always deferred to his younger brother. Speaking to his brother, Joseph once said, Brother Hiram, what a faithful heart you have got. Oh, may the eternal Jehovah crown eternal blessings upon your head as a reward for the care you have had for my soul. Oh, how many are the sorrows we have shared together. Hiram gave unfailing service to the church, end quote. Certainly a remarkable person, Hiram Smith. Well, and what a remarkable reminder that our place may not be out front. Right but serve where we are called to serve because the glory is to the kingdom, not for ourselves. Agreed. Now in verse four, we have the revelation to Samuel, Joseph's brother. It says, behold, I speak a few words unto you, Samuel, for thou also art under no condemnation and thy calling is to exhortation and to strengthen the church. And thou art not as yet called to preach before the world. Amen. Now, you may recall that Samuel is one of the eight witnesses, and while he wasn't yet called at that moment, he would be the first official missionary to the church in a couple of months. Yep. So June 9th, 1830, he will begin that. So again, another example of, I assume, time to prepare before he's sent out to preach. And then in verse 5, we've got Joseph Smith Sr.'s revelation. Verse 5 says, Behold, I speak a few words unto you, Joseph. For thou also art under no condemnation, and thy calling also is to exhortation and to strengthen the church. And this is thy duty from henceforth and forever. Amen. Now for Hiram, Samuel, Joseph Sr., each was called to exhortation and to strengthen the church. It's exciting, but I think it's extra exciting when you think that they're joined in this calling as members of the same family. And then we're at six and seven. This is to Joseph Knight Sr. Verse six, behold, I manifest unto you, Joseph Knight, by these words, that you must take up your cross in the which you must pray vocally before the world, as well as in secret, and in your family, and among your friends, and in all places. And behold, it is your duty to unite with the true church 
and give your language to exhortation continually, that you may receive the reward of the laborer. Amen. Now notice that Joseph Knight Sr.'s revelation is the only one that does not contain the words, Thou art under no condemnation. And perhaps this is directly related to the admonition to unite to the true church. Oliver, Hiram, Samuel, and Joseph Smith Sr. had all been baptized at this point. Joseph Knight Sr. had not yet. Maybe he felt he didn't need to be baptized. Doctrine and Covenants 22 was still a few days away. But I think it's important to know that he felt a desire to be baptized with others on the day the church was organized. But he refrained because he wanted to study the Book of Mormon further. He later wrote, I should have felt better if I had gone forward to be baptized. This information is from an Enzyme article from 1978 by Larry Porter on the Joseph Knight family. We recommended this back in section 12 in that episode. So recommend it if you haven't read it. Mm -hmm. Now, Joseph Knight was baptized a few months after this revelation was received. Notice also, though, before we move on, the desire the Lord had to bless Joseph Knight Sr. at the end there. He says, that you may receive the reward of the laborer. I am giving you this counsel, this direction, these commandments, so that you can receive the reward. I think that has got to be a great reminder for each of us when the Lord calls us to serve. So let's go on to section 24. Let's take a look at this revelation from Saints, volume 1, chapter 9. Let's talk about a little bit of the background. It says, In late June 1830, Emma traveled with Joseph and Oliver to Colesville. Word of Joseph's miracle that spring had spread throughout the area, and now the Knights and several other families wanted to join the church. Quick sidebar here. The miracle that they're referring to is the miraculous healing of Joseph and Polly Knight's son, Newell. And that story is a really good one, It's earlier in that chapter, and I recommend you read it, but we won't cover it right now. Back to the quote. Emma was also ready to be baptized. Like the Knights, she believed in the restored gospel and in her husband's prophetic call, but she had not yet joined the church. After arriving in Colesville, Joseph worked with others to dam a nearby stream so they could hold a baptismal meeting the following day. When the morning came, however, they discovered that someone had wrecked the dam overnight to prevent the baptisms from taking place. Disappointed, they held a Sabbath day meeting instead, and Oliver preached on baptism and the Holy Ghost. After the sermon, a local minister and some members of his congregation broke up the meeting and tried to drag one of the believers away. Emma was all too familiar with opposition to Joseph and his message. Some people called him a fraud and accused him of trying to profit off his followers. Others mocked believers, calling them Mormonites. Wary of trouble, Emma and the others returned to the stream early the next day and repaired the dam. Once the water was deep enough, Oliver waded into the middle of the pool and baptized Emma, Joseph and Polly Knight, and ten others. Now, during the baptism, some men stood along the bank a short distance back and heckled the believers. Emma and others tried to ignore them, but when the group headed back to the night farm, the men followed, shouting threats at the prophet along the way. At the night's house, Joseph and Oliver wanted to confirm the newly baptized women and men, but the group of hecklers outside swelled to a noisy mob of fifty. Worried that they might be attacked, the believers fled to a neighboring house, hoping to finish the confirmations in peace. But before they could perform the ordinances, a constable arrested Joseph and carried him off to jail for causing an uproar in the community by preaching the Book of Mormon. Joseph spent the night in custody, unsure if the mob would capture him and carry out their threats. Emma, meanwhile, waited anxiously at her sister's house while she and their Colesville friends prayed for Joseph's safe release. Over the next two days, Joseph was tried in court and acquitted only to be arrested and tried again on similar charges. After his second hearing, he was set free, and he and Emma returned to their farm in Harmony before she and the Colesville Saints could be confirmed as members of the church. Shortly after Joseph's return to Harmony, July 1830, he received 
three revelations, Doctrine and Covenants section 24, 25, and 26. The following three revelations were given at this time to strengthen, encourage, and instruct leaders of the church. Now, this revelation, this first one in 24, is given to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery. And as we look at it, maybe we ask the question, what can we learn from these encouragements and instructions that can help us in times of difficulty? Let's take a look, starting in verse 1. Behold, thou wast called and chosen to write the Book of Mormon, and to my ministry, and I have lifted thee up out of thine afflictions, and have counseled thee, that thou hast been delivered from all thine enemies, and thou hast been delivered from the powers of Satan and from darkness. Nevertheless, thou art not excusable in thy transgressions. Nevertheless, go thy way, and sin no more. Magnify thine office, and after thou hast sowed thy fields and secured them, go speedily unto the church which is in Colesville, Fayette, and Manchester, and they shall support thee, and I will bless them both spiritually and temporally. Now, notice, in the first part of this, verse 2, Joseph again is being reprimanded. This is not the sign of someone who is trying to self-aggrandize, you know. He's not trying to build himself up. He writes his own reprimands as well as those to others. Thou art not excusable in thy transgressions. There is still mistakes being made, and they're doing their best. But there's an interesting word there in verse 3. Magnify thine office. It's a very common phrase in the church. In the Institute Manual, there's a quote from President Gordon B. Hinckley from the April 1989 General Conference where he talks a little bit more about this. And he says, quote, that word magnify is interesting. As I interpret it, it means to enlarge, to make more clear, to bring closer, and to strengthen. All of you, of course, are familiar with binoculars. When you put the lenses to your eyes and focus them, you magnify and, in effect, bring closer all within your field of vision. But if you turn them around and look through the other end, you diminish and make more distant that which you see. So it is with our actions as holders of the priesthood. When we live up to our high and holy calling, when we show love for God through service to fellow men, when we use our strength and talents to build faith and spread truth, we magnify our priesthood. When, on the other hand, we live lives of selfishness, when we indulge in sin, when we set our sights only on the things of the world rather than on the things of God, we diminish our priesthood. End quote. Great point. The Lord continues to go on and give counsel in verse 6. And it shall be given thee in the very moment what thou shalt speak and write, and they shall hear it, or I will send unto them a cursing instead of a blessing. He's speaking in reference there to the saints in Colesville. And again, that's a great lesson for us all. We have the option to choose blessings or cursings. Well, and not only that, the reassurance that the Lord will give unto Joseph in the very moment what he shall speak and write, and they shall hear it. So in other words, he's reminded that this is the Lord's work, and if the Lord needs him to say something, he will give it the very moment that he needs to speak it. Well, and if we understand that, then these next verses have even more power, starting in verse 8. Be patient in afflictions, for thou shalt have many, but endure them. For lo, I am with thee, even to the end of thy days. And in temporal labors thou shalt not have strength. For this is not thy calling. Attend to thy calling, and thou shalt have wherewith to magnify thine office, and to expound all scriptures, and to continue in laying on the hands and confirming the churches. This has to be a couple of the most ominous verses in all of Scripture. <laughs> well, a blend maybe of ominous and comfort. Well, sure, sure. There is comfort, but my goodness, be patient in afflictions, for thou shalt have many. So here's a warning. 
yeah, you've had afflictions up to this point. You're going to have a lot more. Also, in temporal labors, thou shalt not have strength, for this is not thy calling. In other words, although you're trying your best to provide a living for your family and succeed, you know, from a wealth perspective, yeah, that's not going to work out for you. Yeah. That's not the reason you're here. Yeah, and that's got to be tough, too. It does have to be tough. For some people, that is their calling. Exactly. And those resources come. Not only that, but this has got to be discouraging for Emma to hear, too, because she needs to realize that this is not the end of their afflictions and that they are not going to, how shall I say, live comfortably. Yeah, they'll continue to struggle. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Think about the kind of person it takes to be able to handle that. I guess we'll find out a little bit more in our next section. Absolutely. Well, there's a quote that I wanted to include to that end in the Institute Manual from then Elder Dallin H. Oaks. This is from April 1996 General Conference. He says, quote, Joseph Smith was almost continually on the edge of financial distress. In the midst of trying to fulfill the staggering responsibilities of his sacred calling, he had to labor as a farmer or merchant to provide a living for his family. He did this without the remarkable spiritual gifts that sustained him in his prophetic calling. The Lord had advised him that in temporal labors thou shalt not have strength, for this is not thy calling, end quote. So in other words, what Elder Oaks is saying is the prophecy was fulfilled. Joseph was never, as the world would say, successful in his labors. In worldly things. So again like we talked about with Hiram, fulfill your calling where the Lord places you in the kingdom because what's most important is the kingdom. Going forward, these next few verses, note the blessings promised to Oliver if he would continue faithful in doing what the Lord asked. Phrases like in verse 10, I am with him to the end. In verse 11, in me he shall have glory. And in verse 12, I will give unto him strength such as is not known among men. Wow. Now, in verses 13 through 15, the seminary manual gives a great summary. It says, The Lord instructed Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery regarding miracles they could perform in his name. He also told them about protection they could receive when people opposed them. The Lord gave them some instructions that were different from instructions missionaries receive today. For example... He gave them permission to cast off the dust of their feet as a testimony against those who would not receive them in verse 15. This practice is reserved for extreme circumstances. Full-time missionaries are not authorized to do this today. Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery were also commanded to take no purse nor scrip in verse 18, meaning that they traveled without money and relying on the goodness of church members and others to provide food and shelter. Today, full-time missionaries are not commanded to go without purse or scrip. And there's also an interesting phrase in verse 13, require not miracles. What does that mean? Well, many Christians at this time sought out demonstrations of gifts of the Spirit, etc. The Lord is explaining that this is not appropriate. A further note about casting off the dust of your feet comes from the Institute Manual. This is a quote from Jesus the Christ by Elder James E. Talmadge. He says, quote, To ceremonially shake the dust from one's feet as a testimony against another was understood by the Jews to symbolize a cessation of fellowship and a renunciation of all responsibility for consequences that might follow. It became an ordinance of accusation and testimony by the Lord's instructions to his apostles. In the current dispensation, the Lord has similarly directed his authorized servants to so testify against those who willfully and maliciously oppose the truth when authoritatively presented. The responsibility of testifying before the Lord by this accusing symbol is so great that the means may be employed only under unusual and extreme conditions, as the Spirit of the Lord may direct. Well, that brings us then to... Doctrine and Covenants, section 25. Let's take a look at an introduction to this section from Saints, volume 1, in chapter 9. The Revelation, Doctrine and Covenants 24, left much uncertainty in Emma's life. How would they earn a living if Joseph devoted all his time to the saints? And what would she do while he was away serving the church? Was she supposed to stay at home, or did the Lord want her to go with him? 
And if he did, what would be her role in the church? Knowing Emma's desire for guidance, the Lord spoke to her in a revelation given through Joseph. He forgave her sins and called her an elect lady. He directed her to go with Joseph in his travels and promised, Thou shalt be ordained under his hand to expound scriptures and to exhort the church. He also calmed her fears about their finances. Thou needest not fear, he assured her, for thy husband shall support thee. The Lord then instructed her to make a selection of sacred hymns for the church, for my soul delighteth in the song of the heart, he said. Now, this is a distinctive section in that it's the first recorded revelation directly given to a woman in the Doctrine and Covenants. Yet, the revelation is, as it says in verse 16, God's voice unto all. So now let's take a look at this revelation. In verse 2, A revelation I give unto you concerning my will, and if thou art faithful and walk in the paths of virtue before me, I will preserve thy life, and thou shalt receive an inheritance in Zion. Behold, thy sins are forgiven thee, and thou art an elect lady whom I have called. Now that's a neat phrase. That comes from 2 John, the very first verse, elect lady. From Revelations in Context, we get in 1842, Joseph Smith read the revelation to Emma at the organizational meeting of the Relief Society. He also read 2 John 1, which references the elect lady and explained that she was called an elect lady because she was elected to preside. Joseph stated that the revelation was then fulfilled by Sister Emma's election to the presidency of the society. But there's another interesting phrase in those verses. Verse 2, walk in the paths of virtue before me. President Gordon B. Hinckley gave a landmark talk in General Conference October 1984 called If Thou Art Faithful. We're going to be quoting from this talk a couple of times. You might want to take time to read the whole thing. In this excerpt, he says, quote, I feel those words were given to Emma Smith and consequently to all of us as a condition to be observed if we are to receive an inheritance in the kingdom of God. Lack of virtue is totally inconsistent with obedience to the commandments of God. There is nothing more beautiful than virtue. There is no strength that is greater than the strength of virtue. It is interesting that in this revelation, when the Lord gave that great conditional promise to Emma, he went on to say, Thy sins are forgiven thee, and thou art an elect lady. I am so grateful for the gift of forgiveness extended by a merciful Father. Said the Lord through the prophet Isaiah concerning those who repent and are forgiven, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. To any within the sound of my voice who may be grieving over serious mistakes in their lives, I hold out the assurance given anciently and in modern revelation that where there is repentance, there may be forgiveness. Do not dwell upon the tragic mistakes of the past. Rather, look to God and live. End quote. That's great. Great and inspiring. Let's take a look at verse 4 in here. And there's such good counsel given. And I love that at the end it says that what God says here, he says to all, because it's so applicable to us. Murmur not. Now we could stop the verse right there. He gives some specifics, but that phrase to me means something in my life. Murmur not. Now specifically, he says to her, murmur not because of the things which thou hast not seen. How does that apply to us? Do we murmur about things that we don't have or that we haven't received or that we haven't seen? If so, we can understand what Emma's going through, especially when desires are righteous desires. But he says, murmur not because of the things which thou hast not seen, for they are withheld from thee and from the world, which is wisdom in me in a time to come. So what are we talking about here? Well, I think most obviously it's the plates. You would think that of anybody, Emma, especially since she served as a scribe, that she would get to see the plates. But again, to what end? What is her calling in the church? What's the office of her calling? And the Lord makes that clear next. 
In verse 5, the office of thy calling shall be for a comfort unto my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., thy husband, in his afflictions, with consoling words in the spirit of meekness. Considering the challenges that they're going to have and have had, this is no small calling. And how important. If you've been on the other side of this, where you've been serving in a capacity that's been so difficult for you and to have somebody who can console you, help you in your afflictions in the spirit of meekness. What a blessing. In that same talk John was just quoting in General Conference 1984, President Gordon B. Hinckley, referring to verse 5, says, That is interesting language. She was his wife, his companion, his strength in his afflictions. She was to comfort with consoling words given in a spirit of meekness. I see in that the challenge to every woman who is a wife to set the tone of that which is spoken in the home. There is so much of argument in the homes of the people. It is so destructive. It is so corrosive. It leads only to bitterness heartbreak, and tears. How well advised we would be, each of us, when there is tension, when there is friction, when there is affliction, to speak with consoling words in the spirit of meekness. And then in verse 6, thou shalt go with him at the time of his going. And we read that promise summarized in the saint's introduction. What a blessing that must have been for her to know. She at least has direction. Yeah. In verse 7, And thou shalt be ordained under his hand to expound scriptures and to exhort the church according as it shall be given thee by my spirit. For he shall lay his hands upon thee, and thou shalt receive the Holy Ghost. And thy time shall be given to writing and to learning much. That's a pretty powerful promise. Mm -hmm. From Joseph Smith's Revelations, when the Female Relief Society of Nauvoo was founded in 1842 and the members selected Emma as the president, Joseph Smith read this revelation to those who were present and explained that Emma had been ordained at the time the revelation was given to expound the scriptures to all and to teach the female part of community. That notion of being ordained perhaps needs a little bit of clarification from the Institute Manual, there's a quote from President Joseph Fielding Smith from Church History and Modern Revelation, where he says, quote, The term ordain was used generally in the early days of the church in reference to both ordination and setting apart. Men holding the priesthood were said to have been ordained to preside over branches and to perform special work. Sisters also were said to have been ordained when they were called to some special duty or responsibility. In later years, we developed a distinction between ordain and setting apart. This saying that Emma Smith was ordained to expound scripture does not mean that she had conferred upon her the priesthood, but that she was set apart to this calling, which found its fulfillment in the Relief Society of the Church. End quote. Going on in verse 9, and thou needest not fear, for thy husband shall support thee in the church. Which is a great note considering that we do have a kind of a back and forth here of her supporting him and him supporting her. He goes on, For unto them is his calling, speaking of the church, that all things might be revealed unto them, whatsoever I will, according to their faith. And verily I say unto thee, that thou shalt lay aside the things of this world, and seek for the things of a better. Sister Julie B. Beck, former Relief Society General President, taught the following regarding Emma's role in the Restoration. This is from the Institute Manual. As the Lord began restoring his church through the prophet Joseph Smith, he again, as he did anciently, included women in the pattern of discipleship. A few months after the church was formally organized, the Lord revealed that Emma Smith was to be set apart as a leader and teacher in the church and as an official helper to her husband, the prophet. In her calling to help the Lord build his kingdom, she was given instructions about how to increase her faith 
and personal righteousness, how to strengthen her family and her home, and how to serve others. I hope my granddaughters will understand that from the day the gospel began to be restored in this dispensation, the Lord has needed faithful women to participate as his disciples. This talk can be found, by the way, in the October 2011 General Conference. Now, speaking of General Conference, let's go back to the October 1984 talk that we've been referencing from President Gordon B. Hinckley. He commented on the Lord's instructions to Emma Smith in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 25, verse 10, and this quote can be found in the Institute Manual. He said, I feel he was not telling Emma that she should not feel concerned about a place to live, food on her table, and clothing. He was saying to her that she should not be obsessed with these things, as so many of us are wont to be. He was telling her to get her thoughts on the higher things of life, the things of righteousness and goodness, matters of charity and love for others, the things of eternity. Well, let's take a look at the next couple of verses, 11 and 12. These are some favorites of mine as they pertain directly to music. Verse 11. And it shall be given thee also to make a selection of sacred hymns, as it shall be given thee, which is pleasing unto me, to be had in my church. For my soul delighteth in the song of the heart, yea, the song of the righteous is a prayer unto me, and it shall be answered with a blessing upon their heads. Joseph Smith's revelations reminds us that in 1835, she, along with William W. Phelps, compiled the church's first hymnal, a collection of sacred hymns for the Church of the Latter-day Saints, one of the few church publications at the time, and a book that played an important part in the church's worship practices. The Doctrine and Covenants Institute Manual reminds us that in 1835, the first hymnal of the church was published in Kirtland, Ohio, and the title page identifies Emma Smith as having selected the hymns. She gathered 90 hymn texts from mostly Protestant sources, along with new hymns written by church members, such as W.W. W. Phelps. And it might be interesting for those who are musicians, or maybe even those who aren't, that this hymnal has only the lyrics of the hymns. The music was not printed until later hymnals. It was expected that congregations knew popular hymn tunes of the day, but what's interesting is that you would also run into situations where one hymn would actually sound different in another congregation. They use a different tune. It wouldn't be until later where the music was included and standardized. Yeah, that's interesting. From the Doctrine and Covenants 2001 Institute Manual, so this is the old one, we get a quote from a landmark talk from Elder Boyd K. Packer in October 1973 in which he talks about the importance of music in one's spiritual life. He says, quote, Choose from among the sacred music of the church a favorite hymn, one with words that are uplifting and music that is reverent, one that makes you feel something akin to inspiration. Remember President Lee's counsel. Perhaps I am a child of God would do. Go over it in your mind carefully. Memorize it. Even though you have had no musical training, you can think through a hymn. Now use this hymn as the place for your thoughts to go. Make it your emergency channel. Whenever you find these shady actors have slipped from the sidelines of your thinking onto the stage of your mind, put on this record, as it were. And as a side note to you younger generations, a record is an analog audio recording on a vinyl disc. Ask your parents about it. Maybe your grandparents. Yeah. <laughs> Back to the quote. As the music begins, and as the words form in your thoughts... The unworthy ones will slip shamefully away. It will change the whole mood on the stage of your mind because it is uplifting and clean. The baser thoughts will disappear for while virtue by choice will not associate with filth, evil cannot tolerate the presence of light. In due time, you will find yourself on occasion humming the music inwardly. As you retrace your thoughts, you discover some influence from the world about you encouraged an unworthy thought to move on stage in your mind, and the music almost automatically began. 
There are many references in the scriptures, both ancient and modern, that attest to the influence of righteous music. The Lord himself was prepared for his greatest test through its influence. For the scripture records, And when they had sung an hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. End quote. Great reminder from President Packer. You know, John, I've really understood the importance of inspired music as well, which is why I wrote that song that I sang <laughs> at the beginning. I hope all of you will find that song about the sections of the Doctrine and Covenants inspiring in times of trial. At the very least, help you to remember the names of the various sections. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, let's go on with verse 13. The Lord says, Wherefore, lift up thy heart and rejoice. And cleave unto the covenants which thou hast made. Great counsel for us all. In verse 14, continue in the spirit of meekness and beware of pride. Now that's interesting. Of the counsel that's been given to people, there's only two people that were given the counsel to beware of pride in this grouping today. And that was Oliver Cowdery and Emma. Going on. Let thy soul delight in thy husband, and the glory which shall come upon him. Again, to emphasize that point, whether it's Hiram with Joseph, whether it's Oliver with Joseph, sometimes we are out in front and sometimes we're behind the scenes. Service in the gospel is not for our glory, but for the glory of God. One of my favorite Old Testament examples of that is Saul's son, Jonathan, who was a man like David. I mean, to read his story is to say, wow, this man should be king. But God chose David, and Jonathan's soul delighted in David and his success. So whatever our role is, be the best at it. Remember that our glory is the glory of God. In verse 15, keep my commandments continually, and a crown of righteousness thou shalt receive. And except thou do this, Where I am, you cannot come. And verily, verily, I say unto you, that this is my voice unto all. Amen. There's that last admonition that lest we think that this revelation is just for Emma. Yeah. I mean, parts of it are, certainly. Yep. But this is his voice to everyone. Yeah. There's a quote that I wanted to include from the Institute Manual. This comes from President Russell M. Nelson from his talk in General Conference, October 2015. He says, quote, the women of this dispensation are distinct from the women of any other because this dispensation is distinct from any other. This distinction brings both privileges and responsibilities. In 1979, President Spencer W. Kimball made a profound prophecy about the impact that covenant-keeping women would have on the future of the Lord's church. He prophesied, Much of the major growth that is coming to the church in the last days will come because many of the good women of the world will be drawn to the church in large numbers. This will happen to the degree that the women of the church reflect righteousness and articulateness in their lives and to the degree that the women of the church are seen as distinct and different in happy ways from the women of the world. My dear sisters, you who are vital associates during this winding up scene The day that President Kimball foresaw is today. You are the women he foresaw. Your virtue, light, love, knowledge, courage, character, faith, and righteous lives will draw good women of the world, along with their families, to the church in unprecedented numbers. We, your brethren, need your strength, your conversion, your conviction, your ability to lead, your wisdom, and your voices. The kingdom of God is not and cannot be complete without women who make sacred covenants and then keep them, women who can speak with the power and authority of God. President Boyd K. Packer declared, We need women who are organized and women who can organize. We need women with executive ability who can plan and direct and administer, women who can teach, women who can speak out. We need women with the gift of discernment who can view the trends in the world and detect those that, however popular, are shallow or dangerous. Today, let me add that we need women who know how to make important things happen by their faith 
and who are courageous defenders of morality and families in a sin-sick world. We need women who are devoted to shepherding God's children along the covenant path toward exaltation, women who know how to receive personal revelation, who understand the power and peace of the temple endowment, women who know how to call upon the powers of heaven to protect and strengthen children and families, women who teach fearlessly, end quote. Amen to that. Thank you, President Nelson. Yeah, wonderful. You know, when you're reading that, I don't know if the rest of you felt this way, but as we listened to his words, my mind was called to those women who made such a major impact on my life and the course of my life and what a power and what gratitude I felt. Well, this brings us to Doctrine and Covenants 26. Let me give you a little bit by way of introduction from the Institute Manual. In Colesville, New York, some newly baptized members were not confirmed after their baptism because of mob persecution and the arrest of the prophet on false charges of being a disorderly person, of setting the country in an uproar by preaching the Book of Mormon. In July 1830, the Lord instructed the prophet Joseph Smith, Oliver Cowdery, and John Whitmer to return to Colesville and confirm the baptized individuals there. Newell Knight recorded, This revelation was a great consolation to the little band of brethren and sisters at Colesville after having been abandoned from time to time by the servants of God in consequence of the wickedness of the wicked who were constantly seeking to destroy the work of God from the earth. So let's take a look at this revelation. Now, as you can see, it's pretty short, but very powerful. Verse 1. Behold, I say unto you that you shall let your time be devoted to the studying of the scriptures and to preaching and to confirming the church at Colesville and to performing your labors on the land, such as is required, until after you shall go to the west to hold the next conference. And then it shall be made known what you shall do. And all things shall be done by common consent in the church, by much prayer and faith, for all things you shall receive by faith. Amen. Now, I'd like to point out one very important thing before we get into any other exposition. Note that very important phrase in verse 1. Their time should be devoted to studying of the scriptures. I wonder if anybody was there to tell them how long it would take to read that week's reading. There probably wasn't. I think this was before the Scripturematic 6000 was invented. I think so, yeah. But, oh, what an important admonition for all of us. We here at Scripture Gems wholeheartedly endorse this particular verse. Amen. So, from the Come Follow Me manual, there is a note on the notion of common consent. This is from President Gordon B. Hinckley, April 1995 General Conference. He says, quote, The procedure of sustaining is much more than a ritualistic raising of the hand. It is a commitment to uphold, to support, to assist those who have been selected, end quote. I love that. It's so important that we remember that because all too often I think there are those who would look at our sustainings as a vote or an election, and it really isn't. Yeah. It is our opportunity to commit to support and sustain those whom the Lord has called. Well, and how can we become a Zion people of one heart and one mind if we don't make that commitment to say, so-and-so was called to this responsibility in the kingdom, and I will do my part to sustain and support whom God has selected. That's a really important part of unity. There's a quote in the Institute Manual from President Russell M. Nelson that I think is a great quote to wrap up our thoughts today. Originally, it was found in the October 2014 General Conference. It says this, Often we sing, We thank thee, O God, for a prophet. Do you and I really understand what that means? Imagine the privilege the Lord has given us of sustaining his prophet, whose counsel will be untainted, unvarnished, unmotivated by any personal aspiration and utterly true. How do we really sustain a prophet? Long before he became president of the church, President Joseph F. Smith explained, it is an important duty resting upon the saints who sustain the authorities of the church 
to do so not only by the lifting of the hand, the mere form, but in deed and in truth. Well, thank you, President Nelson. And I think it's about time that our lesson is done. All in favor? (laughs) Any opposed? By common consent, we're wrapping up our lesson today. What a great blessing. And it's hard to even think about how to sum up, except that there is a God in heaven, and this is his living church, and he cares about each one of us. Listen to his counsel. What were you inspired by today? What were you inspired by in this week's reading? What words from living prophets or from the Doctrine and Covenants will change you this week to be a better follower of Jesus Christ? That's a wonderful thing to consider. Keep reading your scriptures and remember those extra resources. When we have this extra time to read, let's take the time to look at Revelations in context. You know that little symbol up by the chapter heading. Or look at Joseph Smith's Revelations. Or look at saints. These are all wonderful resources or church history in the fullness of times. They will help us understand the context around these revelations to help form the Lord's restored church. And we'll talk more about that in our next lesson. We'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But we're really big fans. <laughs>